Hello. Um, International Children's Centre has just launched a new YouTube channel, uh, Children's Rights TV, in Turkish, so that we can reach out younger, uh, our younger audiences, like children, young people, and uh, other people who, who don't have time to read and uh, who actually follow uh, YouTube all the time. Um, uh, so we would like to expand our audience basically on children's rights uh, so that children's rights can be uh, uh, known uh, better. So this is just a promotion, uh, a child rights promotion uh, tool, so to speak. So um, we would like to uh, talk about a new uh, procedure, a new uh, tool for children uh, to complain if their rights are being um, violated. And you are here in Ankara at the moment. Uh, uh, can, you, can you actually first uh, introduce yourself to us? Well, hi, I'm Anita Go. I'm the advocacy officer um, of the NGO group for the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is a network of 79 national, regional, and international organizations. Uh, we are based in Geneva, Switzerland, and mainly our work is to help national organizations to use UN, so international mechanisms, to promote and protect the rights of the child. Uh, you also have another hat, uh, as far as I know, um, so about this new procedure, actually. Yes, indeed, um, since June 2012. I'm also the co-chair of a new international coalition that is called Ratify OP3 CRC. Um, this coalition works only on this ratification campaign for this new procedure that you mentioned, which we call OP3. Um, OP3 really means optional protocol on the communications procedure. So that's a very long name. We thought if we call it OP3, maybe people will remember it better. And in this uh, context, well, with a colleague from Save the Children, we both uh, lead uh, this coalition and give ideas to um, organizations and children and explain what this OP3 is. So can you please start explaining uh, what OP3 is? Well, of course. Um, OP3, it's an international treaty. So it's a text, an official document. Um, that sets out a new procedure that children can use directly. That means that in case their rights are violated, maybe they will go to court first, but maybe they will not get any kind of solution. So this OP3 provides a solution at the international level. Children will be able to go to an expert body, so it's a committee, Committee on the Rights of the Child, that is composed of independent experts that are all experts on child rights. And this expert body will be able to examine the complaints from children and help them to find a solution. So you, you are saying that so far, with, until this uh, protocol, there were no complaints procedures for children. Um, why is that? And uh, are there other complaints procedures for other international human rights instruments? Yeah, in fact, until OP3, there were international complaints procedures for all other human rights. So they were somehow open to children because children have the same human rights as adults, but they were not specifically designed for children's rights. So for example, they could not help with issues regarding the right to play or the right to go to school, things like this that are very specific to children. Um, the reason why, I guess, you know, when the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the key international document that sets out all the rights that children have, when this convention was drafted, they didn't include a complaints procedure then. And then it was just left like this for quite a while until NGOs started really pushing to get this complaints procedure and put children on the same level as adults. Um, so what does this um, complaints procedure entail? Uh, what sort of uh, mechanisms does it entail? Um, 
can children go directly to the court, for example? Uh, can uh, NGOs who are working for children can go to the court? Um, uh, so, what are the um, what are the characteristics of this convention, of this new protocol? Yeah. Well, there are different uh, mechanisms that are set within OP3. One key thing to remember, however, and it's very important, is that this international procedure is here to complement what already exists in the states. So you can only go at the international level if you have tried to find a solution in your state first. So if you have tried to uh, talk to the national judges, go to the national courts, try to find a solution to the violation you have suffered. If you couldn't find a solution, this is where OP3 comes into play. And there, there are mainly two big mechanisms. One is what is called the individual communications, and one is called inquiry procedure. For the individual communications, children themselves, directly, can present a complaint to the Committee on the Rights of the Child that I mentioned before. They can also decide that they should be, I mean, to be represented by someone. It could be a parent, it could be a lawyer, it could be an NGO, it could be a friend, a doctor, social worker, anyone that the child trusts can represent the child at the international level. And as I mentioned, NGOs can have a role here representing child victims in the individual communications procedure. The other and second mechanism I mentioned is the inquiry procedure, which is quite different because individual communications, you need to have been a victim of a violation and you present a complaint about your personal case. Inquiry procedure, anyone, not necessarily victims, so not necessarily children either, could be bar associations, it can be ombudspersons, national human rights um, institutions, NGOs again, academics, anyone who has an interest and who has information about grave or systematic violations of children's rights. If they have this information, they are welcome to send the info to the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which will examine the information and decide whether they want to launch an investigation or not. So, individual communications procedure and inquiry procedure are the two main mechanisms of OP3. Uh, can governments opt out in one of them? Basically, again, OP3, because it's an international treaty, needs to be accepted by states. So that's what we call ratification. If a state ratifies OP3, it can decide to take the inquiry procedure out, meaning that they don't accept it, they only accept the individual communications procedure. So we will have to see for each state what are the mechanisms that they accept and whether they take out the inquiry procedure or not. Well, this inquiry procedure is highly important actually for children because we know that many children may not have the capacity or uh, um, means to go to Geneva and represent their cases. Or there may be some cases that would affect more than one children or a, a group of children. Then NGOs should actually use this uh, inquiry procedure and or uh, ombuds offices or other offices. Uh, do you think that it is good for governments to opt out or do they need to fear uh, uh, this procedure? I mean, the inquiry procedure exists already for all the other existing international complaints procedures. So it's nothing new. It is not specifically, I mean, it hasn't been created specifically for children. It has been created for other mechanisms. So it's really a package. Normally, when you accept that complaints, violations can be examined at the international level, you accept that they can be examined either as individual complaints or as general information about grave or systematic violations. And again, I want to really emphasize this point. Uh, OP3, the aim and objective is to help the state to better implement the child rights obligations it has already accepted. So states should really see this as an additional tool that will help them see what doesn't work in practice in the state. Many times we see that you know, when they draft a legislation, you cannot think about all the different practical cases that will happen. So you think my law is good and it will work. 
But because there are some violations, and thanks to this kind of international procedures that show the violations that do happen, it helps states realize, well, maybe my legislation didn't cover everything, maybe there were some gaps. So indeed, I think there's nothing to fear about this. Also, as an international procedure, it's always in cooperation with the state. So the inquiry procedure, the committee um, shares the information with the state, and it's only if the state accepts that the committee can do a country visit, so it's always done in collaboration with state representatives. Um, also, and you mentioned this and it's very important, the inquiry procedure, because it doesn't have this direct link with victims, could be used especially for cases where child victims are particularly vulnerable, and we can think of cases of sexual exploitation, mm -hmm. or trafficking, or pornography, prostitution, etc., where it might actually re-victimize the child to go through an international procedure individually, whereas the inquiry procedure, because it has this you know, more general approach, could help to reintegrate the child, not put the child through another ordeal, and still address the violations that have happened. Well, thank you for these information, but I would like to ask a couple more questions, especially uh, uh, the way the optional protocol is laid out. Um, do you think for children who doesn't have the means, or for many countries who, whose uh, NGOs are not developed well enough and or do not have the funding to go to Geneva and um, present their cases to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Do you think, uh, and also we know that there are some budgetary issues around uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child and other committees' works. So do you think that this uh, procedure is, um, or, or will provide uh, some sort of uh, assistance to those children who would like to take their uh, uh, cases to this international body? Well, there are two things in your question. Like One is about the procedure itself. One thing is that this international complaints procedure is really a written procedure. So although it may be possible to have oral hearings, it is not obligatory. So the committee would not expect from children to go to Geneva and present the cases directly. They can send you know, the complaint by email, uh, by post, Etc. So that's already a budget of resources that are not necessarily needed. One thing that is true, though, is that the committee can only receive complaints drafted in a UN official language. For example, Turkish is not One. an official language. So in that case, they would need to either send a complaint in Arabic or in English, or French, Spanish, Russian, or Chinese, in case this is relevant in Turkey. But again, this may be a budgetary concern or more a resource concern for children in Turkey that they would need to have the complaint professionally translated actually because you know it is a legal procedure so you want the complaint to be uh, very clear you want to have your allegations very clear as well so you would need a professional translation there I can see a role for NGOs obviously maybe and this we will see with time that could be a role from UNICEF or from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that could maybe work with the state and provide some kind of fund to actually help children to access international complaints procedure. This is something that I think we should all start thinking about and discussing with those stakeholders. Now, about the uh, resources of the committee itself. In theory, as OP3 says, the committee is the one that examines the complaints, communicates with uh, the victim, communicates with the state, and uh, decides on the issue, drafts all the reports, etc. In practice, the committee has the support of a secretariat, and there are several uh, legal experts that actually already work on other international complaints procedure and other ones who communicate with the victims and transmit the communication and information to the state. So here we expect uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child to benefit from the same support. Uh, we will have to see in practice if this is enough or not. But I think one key thing as well will be to 
draft complaints as professionally as we can. Because if you have already included all the relevant information, then there's less need for transmission, communication, and delaying of the process, and more human resources in the end. If we all can get a good training and a good understanding as to how we should present a complaint to the committee, then normally, you know, it can go straight to the examination on the substance and we already gain some time and some different steps and we use less people uh, in that process. You highlighted a very important issue, um, which is training and capacity building on this area. Uh, is there any, at the moment, resource or uh, capacity building tools like training materials or guidelines or guides for NGOs or for other for, for governments uh, as to how to bring or children themselves actually that they can under, in, in a written language that they can understand um, or um, are we need, do we need to uh, work on that as well? Well Basically, as the NGO group for the CRC, so that's my individual organization, we have committed ourselves uh, to well, produce publications on behalf of the international coalition that I mentioned before, Ratify OP3. We have started now with a leaflet, just general information. We are now finalizing a child-friendly leaflet as well, so that children can understand what OP3 is. And uh, for 2013, actually, we have uh, in the pipeline a commentary of OP3, so which will explain article by article quite in some detail what each article means, what it means in practice for lawyers, practitioners, NGOs that may want to present a complaint. And we also um, have planned to do a training of trainers, uh, still more at an informational level, but this would be 2013 as well. As soon as the OP3 enters into force, so as soon as 10 states have ratified it, uh, we will, at least as the NGO group, uh, work less on the ratification campaign and focus much more on building capacity and empower different actors to actually use the complaints mechanism, including very specific training about how to draft a complaint and um, present it, send it to the committee. Uh, at least as a publication. It could be as well uh, in-house training, regional trainings, as we have done for other types of UN mechanisms in the past. We can also expect the Office of the High Commissioner to produce some tools. There are several tools that exist about existing international complaints mechanisms, so this could already be a reference because this one is just following the same general rules as other international complaints mechanisms. So NGOs, anyone who's interested can already look as to how the other ones work and will already have a general idea as to how this one will work. But OHCHR most probably will have to update their own handbook and include specific guidance uh, for the use of OP3. I have two more questions. Um, one is... Uh as far as I know, Turkey signed up, signed the uh, optional protocol recently. Uh, and the other question is, let's say in Turkey, if uh, and when, I'm sure that it's, it will happen, Turkey ratifies the optional protocol, how a child can t take one case to the uh, com Committee on the Rights of the Child? I mean... Does he or she has to exhaust some remedies within the country, or uh, what is the procedure? Mm -hmm. Well, you are exactly, I mean, totally correct. Turkey signed uh, OP3 on the 24th of September, so it's very recent. Uh, of course, when the state signs an international treaty, it's a commitment that they will ratify. So we expect that the ratification process will start quite soon and hopefully have a ratification at the latest by the end of 2013. As soon as it is ratified and provided that we have 10 ratifications, this would mean that children in Turkey would be able to use uh, this procedure. Now, how it will work? First of all, any complaint will have to um, concern a violation of a right that happened after the entry into force 
uh, of OP3. So only after that happened after the ratification by Turkey. Uh, then something I mentioned before, it's that OP3 complements national procedures. So as you mentioned, actually, children will have to go through every existing judicial uh, remedy at the national level. So in Turkey, it could mean, you know, go to the first tribunal, then to the appeal court, then maybe to the Supreme Court, until they reach a final decision, except if they can prove that those remedies um, are ineffective or they are unduly prolonged. In that case, they will be able to go directly to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. But the principle is that what we call exhaustion of domestic remedies is that they have to try the case first before the national courts. Well, NGOs actually know very much of uh, the European Court of Human Rights and how to lodge a complaint to, at the court. So what is the difference between this court and this new mechanism for children? That I would say mainly two big differences. Like one is that the European Court, because of its uh, mandate and structure, is actually stronger than the Committee on the Rights of the Child. It's a court, so it can make legally binding decisions. Basically, they, make, they deliver judgments. Whereas the Committee on the Rights of the Child, once they examine violations, if they find that there have been a violation, they will issue recommendations, which are not legally binding. The state is expected to follow them, but there is no like real um, accountability mechanism after this. So this is where, let's say, the European Court is a bit stronger than the Committee on the Rights of the Child. But the second main difference is that the European Court can only decide cases under the European Convention. And we all know that the European Convention does not include all the rights that children have under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So this is where OP3 is actually stronger than the European Court mechanism, because you will be able to allege all the violations of rights under the CRC, but also in the case of Turkey, under the optional protocol on the sale of children and under the optional protocol on children in armed conflict. So it's a wider range of rights that children have that can be uh, claimed under OP3. Well, thank you for explaining this new uh, complaints procedure, this new mechanism specifically designed for children. Uh, and thank you for uh, giving all this information. Sure, thank you.